Welcome to The Art of Charm. I'm your host, Jordan Harbinger, and I'm here with producer Jason DeFilippo. Here at The Art of Charm, we don't have all the answers, but we certainly have a lot of questions. And of course, today on Fan Mail Friday, those questions come from you. And then we'll do our best to get you the answers and advice and good old-fashioned tough love to help you get through these situations. But mostly, we're just here for our own entertainment, right? That's about it. You know, it's like I love helping people, but also there's something about checking that inbox where I just go, you know, my life's not so bad. There's a lot of stuff in here that's really horrible, um, and I'm not happy about that at all, but I am happy to help. And this is sort of a holiday edition, right, in that it's the holidays and for no other reason. But I think that <laughs> <laughs> I think that people really – the inbox gets packed over the holidays because people go home and they got their family or they, do, they break up or they're long distance with their sweetheart or something like that. And there's just a lot of, a lot of people's ish comes out over the holidays, Jason. That it does. That it does. I mean, my own ish is coming out, too. I had pumpkin pie for breakfast. That's not normal. Oh, God. There's nothing normal about that at all. Oh, way to start the show off with the uh, classy. Let's do a classy. I didn't time. even put it on a plate. I just <laughs> ate pieces of the edge of the pie out of the pie tin that was in the fridge. I wish we had pumpkin pie at my Christmas dinner. We had mint pie. That's just wrong. Nobody should have a mint pie. That sounds terrible, actually. I, yeah. I love pumpkin pie, so I always get pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving and then for Christmas, and then for the rest of the year, I basically don't get to have any. So screw it. If I want to have pumpkin pie for breakfast the day after Christmas, that's what's happening. If I don't want to put it on the plate, it doesn't matter. Although something funny did happen. I, I kind of felt a little element of shame eating it, right? And I heard Jenny come home, so I started to just inhale the rest of the piece that I had on my fork, and I started coughing uncontrollably, and Jen's like, oh, no, are you getting sick? And I'm like, no. She's like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, nothing. She's like, you're being weird. And I was like, fine, I ate pumpkin pie for breakfast. And I inhaled it so fast that I'm I choked on it a little bit. And she's like, oh, my God. Uh, you're feeling crummy because you ate too many crumbs. Yeah, I'm just a man child. I turned into a man child <laughs> on the holidays. I sit around, I play video games, I watch superhero stuff on Netflix, and I eat junk food out of a container instead of being an adult and putting it in a free. It's like, you know, when you're a kid and there's no clean bowls, and so you pour your Lucky Charms into like a giant salad bowl and you eat it with the serving spoon. <laughs> Yep. That's that's what that's the I'm basically doing that, except I found an actual bowl and just decided not to use it or an actual plate. I didn't even try to find one or as a little kid has at least put in the effort. You know, I mean, we're, we're adulting most of the year. You can take a week off every now and again and just be a man child. It's OK. Nobody's going to judge you. For that's it. that's kind of how I feel about it. All right. That makes sense. Now let's hear from people with real problems. Take it away, Jay. Hey, guys, I'll get straight to it. I broke up with my man due to long distance, lack of communication, recurring patterns of behavior, and disempowering beliefs. Oh, that's it? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it? Yeah. That's the only reason? Short list. <laughs> I deleted and stopped all forms of communication after the breakup, which has been a month. He's made every attempt to get in contact, especially via friends, and has become somewhat remorseful. He's accepted getting back together is not an option, but is desperate to have me in his life. I'm in a good place after some me time and think I'm ready to communicate, but really aren't sure what is best for him. He's out of state for another few weeks before he's back in town and more than likely on my doorstep. I've never not had an amicable split and I'm really lost on whether to let this one go or salvage a friendship. Signed, in a bind. I want to give her some props here for deleting and stopping all forms of communication after the breakup because a lot of people don't do that. And then it's like... Oh, I'm just going to send a quick text. Oh, well, this is happening. Oh, this person's drinking. Now they're going to call me. It's just not a good idea. So I, I love that she just deleted everything. And it's like, oh, I don't know how to get. What if there's an emergency? You have email. Your friends have the phone number. If there's a real emergency, you're fine. Otherwise, you should be blocking and unfriending or at least not looking at their stuff. It's just because it just invites drama. But he's made every attempt to get in contact. OK, that's not good. And. You know why you broke up with him. These reasons seem good. You're in a good place after me time. You might be ready, but obviously he's not through this. He didn't go, hey, we've been broken up for a year. Just wondered how you were doing. You know, I've went through a lot of stuff. Just want to make sure you're okay, too. No, this sounds like it's a month. He's like, Angela, right? So he's like freaking <laughs> out. Yeah. And he's trying to desperately to get through to you. There's not going to be a friendship here. He wants to get back together. He's not desperately trying to be friends. People don't do that. So his idea or the idea that him communicating with you is somehow going to lead to a friendship as uh, I saw Star Wars and Admiral Akbar was in that one. You know, he's the guy who says, it's a trap. This is a trap. People don't want friends that badly. 
So whatever he's doing now, he has something else in mind. If he's clamoring around your whole network to try to get in touch with you. And if he's overseas still, he's got a lot of time and he's idealizing you, right? So he's, the idea of you and the fact that you're no longer his girlfriend anymore is really bugging him and his imagination's going crazy. But he doesn't miss all of the good things about you or if he does, then it's a little bit too late. So my question to you would be, why have him in your life? It'll be messy. Boundaries will not be respected, almost certainly. You'll end up either hooking up or fighting because expectations are mismatched. In other words, he, you know, you think, oh, we can be friends. And he's like, I'm going to win her back. But you're not going to be responsive to that. Or you will. It's going to cause drama. Or you get back together. And then you have a really bitter breakup where you're both super pissed and it gets vindictive. Look, he can be remorseful about his behavior without getting you back because of it, without getting back together with you because of it. Let him learn his lesson here. You don't owe him, you don't owe him squat, girl. You don't owe him anything, right? And he's going to try to make you feel like that's the case. And it sounds to me like she says here, Jason, I've never had a non-amicable split. Well, mm -hmm. there's a first time for everything. It you shouldn't <laughs> sounds be like this is it. Yeah, and and the, here's the thing: you can't control what they feel. You can try to placate him or whatever by quote unquote making it amicable, but then what? Just so you have a perfect record of amicable splits until he decides that he's m even more mad than he was before because you're not giving him what he wants. I think this is a huge mistake. It sounds like she just doesn't want to quote unquote be mean to him or let him suffer, but. He didn't seem to have a problem doing that to you from the sound of it. Yeah, she doesn't want to break her perfect record, which is not a reason to bring somebody back into your life. Exactly. Like, what if what if you've never had an amicable split, but this person stole from you or was physically abusive? Would you give a crap about your perfect record? I don't believe that for a second. I think that's like the dumbest thing that you could say here. I, and in fact, it's so dumb that I don't believe she even means it. I think she means she's never had a split go bad. But I don't think she for a second really cares that that's a pro I don't think that's a real problem for her. I think she's looking for an excuse to maybe alleviate some guilt, which you should not do in this case. All right, let's hear from the next one. Hi, Jordan. I'm a 29 year old living in New York City, and I've been working in the orthopedic physical therapy industry for the last six years after getting my master's. I love my job and feel fulfilled in that I can actually make a difference in people's lives. I meet really cool people, some of whom became friends over time that do really cool things, which I attribute as a product of living in NYC. I'm very personable and interactive with people, which makes my job fun. When it comes to money, I think I've reached a peak as I get paid above average for my field and there's little room for professional growth. Management isn't great for a number of reasons, and I've certainly thought about quitting at times. The issue I'm having is that I have an opportunity to work with my parents in the suburbs as a manager for their real estate and restaurant businesses, which one day I'll ultimately take over. I've read plenty of books about success and know that the most successful people are not those who work for others, but own their own businesses. I'm getting served a business on a platter and know that I'm lucky for the opportunities. The real dilemma in these options is lifestyle. On the one hand, I have everything I want. I have a job I'm proud of. I love living in the city. I'm in the longest relationship I've ever been in with an awesome girl who also lives in the city, and I have great friends here. And I'm not struggling financially. Even with all this, I feel like I'm in a loop and empty, constantly wondering if this is all life has to offer. On the other hand, working with my parents will make me much more financially stable at a much younger age in a company that I will call mine one day. This may provide me more opportunities in the future to expand or gain more travel experience, though I don't know if I can live a suburban lifestyle away from my girlfriend, friends, and the hustle of the city for four to five days out of the week. I understand that these are good problems to have, but if I make the decision to forego what I went to school for, to leave the city and start working for my parents, I feel like I may lose some independence that I cherish. I definitely know that I need a change, but I just don't know if a career change is going to fulfill me. What else do you think I should consider before making any decisions? Thanks for all you do. Random alias. All right, random alias. He put a lot of thought into that one. <laughs> yeah, put it, yeah, he really went the extra mile there for that. I, but I dig it. I dig it. It's like, it's very meta. I would say you need to get the city out of your system. There's something amazing about New York, San Francisco, Chicago, that big city life that is just so exciting and fun at that age especially. So my question to you would be, can you reverse commute from the city to the suburbs to go to work? It seems weird, but people do it. 
And you're of the age of people that will do that. The other thing you could do is you could do an Airbnb lifestyle on weekends in the city. So you don't live in the city. You live in the suburbs. You can really focus on working in the business. And maybe you can pull extra hours at your parents' business. Like maybe you work 10 hours, 12 hours a day, Monday through Thursday, and then you take Fridays off. Then you can rent a place in the city on Airbnb or hang out with your girlfriend three days a week. Which And then you have that time dedicated with each other to hang out and, and enjoy yourself. For me, I thought I would never leave the city. And then one day I was complaining to Jason about the 200th motorcycle that ruined some show or some commercial. And I basically then realized I was an old man and I bought a house in the suburbs pretty soon after that. It was the best day of our lives oh, for yeah. this show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. No, we get a quiet place. And I, I also found that I'd stop going out every night and or even every week. And I kind of turned into a homebody with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And I turned into that in the city, which made no sense. I was, li- I was living in the city, and I was like, oh, I got to be around all these people all the time. I got to go around and do this. Oh, I wish I could just get in my car and go somewhere. I love the city. I can go up there anytime. I can grab food with friends. I can just take the train or a car back. It's still cheaper than living there, even if I go up every single week. It's still cheaper. So I would say if you can't do one of these commute dealios, live there for a while, and if you have to put off working for the parents a couple of years, then do that as well. But I'd look into that reverse commute it, it, or the Airbnb lifestyle. It might be really worthwhile for you. And then eventually you'll get sick of the city. And then you already have the best of both worlds, getting your feet wet with your parents' business. This episode of Fan Mail Friday is sponsored by HostGator. Social networks are always changing, and all that work you put into cultivating your walled garden on Facebook could be a weed-infested MySpace before you know it, and then you're back to square one. But if you own your own website, you got it made in the shade. And that's why here at AOC, we recommend getting your website on HostGator. HostGator includes a ton of tools and guarantees with each hosting plan. No data cap. In other words, you're not going to get a crazy huge bill. Free website builder, so it's easy. Unlimited email addresses and 24-7, 365 tech support. If you're not completely satisfied, cancel within 45 days for your money back. Not a big deal. You can get it all by going to HostGator.com slash charm. And for being a part of the AOC family, HostGator's giving you half off. All their packages for new users. That's hostgator.com slash charm right now to take advantage of our discount and send us your URL when you get your site up and we'll go check it out. Hey guys, I want to tell you something you might not want to hear. It's hands down the most important thing I've learned in my life, but it might upset a few people. Here it is. You're not going to succeed because you're smart or because you're talented or because you work harder than everyone else. Tried that, been there, done that. These are all super important for sure, but they are not a formula for a guaranteed successful career. What will make you succeed? Your social capital. I'm talking about that hidden currency that creates wealth, connection, and meaning in our lives. I'm talking about the principles, mindsets, and tools that allow you to share your value with other people and make other people want to share their value with you. That, more than any other variable, is what determines success. I've seen it in my life, I've seen it in the lives of our alumni, and I've seen it in every major study on the determinants of success. So, if you want to go from just doing your job to leading projects and people, if you want to stop selling to your customers and start building real relationships with them, if you want to be someone whose relationships create opportunities for you, then it's time to join us here for a live program. Hit me up, jordan at theartofcharm.com, and let's chat about how you can start building your social capital today. Thanks for listening and supporting The Art of Charm. For a list of all of our amazing sponsors and discounts, visit theartofcharm.com slash advertisers. Now, back to Fan Mail Friday. All right, next up. Hi, Jordan. I started listening to the podcast when I was 15 years old and having trouble making friends in high school. After learning the basics of body language and vocal tonality, I was able to make many friends and become very secure in myself. Now I'm 23 years old and I'm about to start my career in engineering, and the skills I have learned in body language have served me well in learning to communicate with others. At this point, with all of my schooling out of the way, I'd now like to look to start dating seriously but I noticed that I feel hesitant. After some thoughtful examination, I realized it's because a part of me feels of lower value to women because of my height. I'm five foot five and have been so since I was 15. Typically, I'm very confident in my abilities, but I'm not overly outspoken about my confidence because I prefer to keep to myself most of the time. Although this doesn't stop me if I'm interested in a woman, I have no trouble flirting or talking to her. The problem is that most women, especially in the online dating world, want men who are much taller than me, even if I am of a similar height to them. 
For a while, I felt that having my first girlfriend would make this insecurity go away. But after breaking up with her months ago and starting to think about dating again, I realized this insecurity is still here. I wanted to learn how to manage this insecurity, which I typically do by reading books. But surprisingly, when searching for the topic, I found little content that's helpful for my situation. How can I learn to cope with my insecurity? And where are some good places to meet women outside of the online dating world where height preferences can screen me out completely? Signed, Tall on the Inside. All right, look, Tall on the Inside. I could bring up all the celebrities like Kevin Hart and Tom Cruise and Elijah Wood that are relatively short, but you just excuse that by saying, well, they're celebrities, they have lots of money, and you'd be right. I didn't notice when I was younger that women... I was dating were taller than me. I know that sounds really dumb in retrospect, but I remember being in Germany and dating this girl in high school who is really beautiful. And she was a lot taller than me, a lot taller. She was a bikini model actually. And she was really fine and probably a good several inches taller than me. And my host brother at the time, he, one day he said, doesn't it suck that she's taller than you? And I said, no, why? And he goes, cause the guy's supposed to be taller than the girl. And I went, well, that's dumb. How do you know that? And he goes, that's just the way it is. And I said, really? I never really cared. I never really noticed about that because I dated women that were pretty tall and not tall. I just never even thought of it as a factor because I had my head in my butt when I was younger. But it worked for me. (laughs) And the women didn't care and just went with it because since I didn't notice, it didn't affect my confidence. So you do notice now. So now what? I would say, number one, realize you can make up for your height with personality and other channels and other attraction switches like potential, career, economics, which is, I know people are like, what, how dare you mention that? It's just being real here and being well-connected, that kind of thing. Funny, all these different channels will help make up for that. And I know people are thinking, you shouldn't have to make up for that. I'm just giving real talk here. Number two, you can also date short women. I did both of these things. I'm 5'10", which to me seems short when I look at guys who are taller than me. And here's another thing. Tall friends also say things like, well, yeah, you know, but you're so outgoing or you're stylish or you're funny and I'm not. And I'm like, you're 6'4". You know, everyone's got their own pet insecurity. Height happens to be yours. Another thing is that stated preferences aren't the same as actual preferences. Lots of guys like blondes and then marry brunettes anyway. It doesn't matter after the first few dates. Trust me. The height thing is a problem for online dating. That is for sure. Even if you're 5'10", it would be a problem. There's going to be a bunch of people. I don't date anybody under six feet or whatever. Not much can be done here other than to date less online or when you speak to women online, just showcase personality, let them know you don't meet the height requirements and they can either get over that or not. And if they bounce after that, good, because you're screening for people who don't care about height that much. That's just the reality of your situation. Just like if I'm... Native American and I happen to like big blonde women or something like that, I have to throw that out there. Some people just don't like pizza, all right? And that's the way it is. So best of luck out there. You are far from being disadvantaged here. I mean, in the scheme of disadvantages, an engineer who is born in the United States and fun and outgoing and cool, who happens to be a little bit shorter or of average height, I mean, just... I get what you're saying here. I understand, but it, there's just not that much sympathy that I can spread around here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is just really not that big of a deal. It's so much more in your head than it is anywhere else. Especially since he's looking at dating online right now. So he's getting that drilled into his head that he's not tall enough just because he's looking in the wrong area already. Exactly. You know, OK, he's, he's algorithmically dating, which is getting him filtered out. But that's just not the real world, you know. I know many guys who are of diminutive stature that date amazingly tall women because the personality is what matters. As far as I can tell from all of my friends who are, you know, are shorter than me that date people. And it's funny. You said you were 5'10". I never pictured you as any shorter than me. And I'm six feet tall. Oh, really? I never noticed a height difference. I never noticed a height difference between us. That's funny. I'm 5'10 with shoes on. All right. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I might even be 5'9 with shoes on. I'm getting older, probably shrinking. (laughs) So, yeah, just drinking. <laughs> it, it, it does happen all the time. I had a, I got a friend who I thought was my height and I saw him recently and I went, oh, shoot, man, you're like five, six, huh? And he's like, yeah, uh, I haven't gotten any smaller since law school. And I was like, yeah, I just never noticed. And he goes, you know what? That's funny. Other people have said that, too. And it's because he's outgoing, good looking, smart, outspoken. So he and he takes up the right amount of physical space. So I just never really noticed it. And his wife is taller than him. 
and it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter at all. Uh, it's one of those things where people go, well, you know, I like women with short hair, or I like women with curly hair. It's like, okay, yeah, but if somebody who's great in every other respect doesn't have it, you're not like, oh, well, can't get it up. I mean, that's not how these things work, <laughs> it's right? It's not how it works. It's not how it works yeah. at all. Yeah, if you, t- if you asked me my preferences for my perfect woman, I would, I would give you a laundry list, and my longest relationships have had absolutely zero correlation with that list. It's all about personality. Uh-huh, yeah, it really is. And as for us guys, we're pretty lucky because we benefit from the it's all about personality thing a lot more than women do. You know, because you might hear guys say, yeah, you know, she's just got to be a really cool person, blah, 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 blah. But we have kind of a binary switch, like attractive enough or not attractive enough. Whereas women have this <laughs> totally different spectrum, right? Like either we're kind of into it physically or not. Women have this as well, but there's also like a billion other channels. Right. And, and if you don't believe me, look at any time you've seen a guy with a girl and you go, what the heck does that guy have? He must be rich. It's like, or he's funny, or he's cool, or he's got a great network. Or where they work, he's, you know, the cool guy because he's the best skateboarder and that's what they're into. Like, you just don't know. But when you see a guy dating a woman, you almost always go, well, yeah, I mean, she's gorgeous. And so guys have it easier in this respect. And it's just a biological, evolutionary, psychological type deal. And it's unfortunate, but being a little bit shorter, holy cow, man, cry me a river. Yeah, I think Tull on the inside is going to do okay. I do too. I mean, even this email is well written. So. Yeah. You actually have that as an advantage in online dating. The fact that you can write a coherent sentence, you're already in like the 98th percentile of guys. <laughs> All right. Sure, she might date guys over six feet tall, but the last time she spoke to one of those guys who can spell correctly was like, you know, back in 07. Not that tall guys are dumb. I'm just saying a lot of the guys online, some of the stuff is that I see from my female friends is bananas. That's another, that's a whole nother can of worms here. All right, let's go on to somebody who's got real relationship issues. Dear Jordan and the AOC family, I'm an Asian American woman who comes from a background of almost tiger parents, but not that intense, where going to school was a big deal. Now, Jordan, can you enlighten us on tiger parents? Yes, they are. In in fact, I think it's it's supposed to be just Asian because I think they're like, oh, let's let's not use dragon because it's a little bit too kind of racist. But tiger is also an Asian animal. Essentially what these are, do you know what helicopter parents are? Is that a term that you know? Oh, yes, I do. Yes, okay, I so know that tiger parents well. are the Asian helicopter parents where gotcha. it's, well, you know, my son is a doctor and their kids are grandkids. They each play a stringed instrument and the piano and a wind instrument. They have Chinese school on Saturday and they have Japanese school on Sunday and they have ballet on Friday and then they have soccer. But, you know, they're going to spend the summer at Juilliard Kids Camp. And it's like, <laughs> oh, my God, these kids hate you. You just don't know it yet. That's what tiger parents are. She says almost tiger parents where they probably didn't make her feel bad about herself for not achieving, but they certainly applied the pressure. Tiger parents are known as you get all straight A's and then you have one A minus and they're like, you're not getting ice cream now. Why'd you get an A minus? And it can be pretty bad. You know, it can be pretty bad. And and unfortunately, and I see this a lot now that I'm essentially surrounded by Asian people 24 seven with my extended family here in California. I see this happen a lot where there'll be a kid who's really smart and has a lot of potential, but what he's really good at is like graphic design. And I just go, oh, man, oh, man I'm so sorry to hear this. Because, of course, the parents are like, when are you going to get your CPA certification? And he's got this amazing graphics design project and an internship at some gaming company. And I'm thinking, wow, people would people would trample you for this. You know, but the parents just think, what am I going to tell my friends? And it's not every Asian parent. It's not even every tiger parent. But that's what tiger parents are kind of known to be, just putting a ton of pressure on their kids, usually immigrant parents. So they want their kid to be like the Mayo Clinic, you know, chief resident at the Mayo Clinic by age 14 or they failed in life. All right. So she says that her parents were not that intense, but school was still a big deal. So she says, not surprisingly, that mindset has been ingrained in me. And while I understand that it's not for everyone, my path has led me to pursue a career as an academic physician, a.k.a. school is life. I am 26 and in a place in my graduate career where things are going well. I've been with my boyfriend for a little over three months now. He makes me incredibly happy, and I feel like this is the healthiest relationship I've ever had. He lives his life with a growth mindset and is not intimidated by my career prospects, which has been an issue in past relationships. 
However, just yesterday, I found out that he has dropped out of college and never got his bachelor's degree. He had an athletic scholarship, but then tore his ACL, but I never realized he didn't finish his degree. Well, I know that degrees aren't everything, although this is hard for me because I'm a little bit of a degree hog. My concern is that this isn't the first time he's dropped out of a school. He also enrolled in a culinary school and left midway, although this was because of a death in the family. Although we're okay now, I'm worried that as I progress in my career, there will be a growing divide between us in terms of education level or even career achievement. Am I justified in my concern or am I just vain? Thanks for your input. Vain and confused. It's interesting that she asked if her concern is valid or if she's just being vain. It seems like you're not vain at all, but you feel guilty about feeling this way. And so that makes you it shows up as you thinking maybe you're vain. But I don't think it's vain. And I think you probably also know that this is a real values difference. I think he may have good excuses for dropping out. But when people do that and they want to actually finish their degree, they go back to school. Jason, am I missing something here? Because it seems like if you drop out because someone in your family died, unless that was the person that was financing your schooling, maybe, I don't know why you would not go back. Yeah, that's an odd one because, you know, if he's if he's already in culinary school and there is a death in the family, why wouldn't you just turn around and go back once you take care of the family business? Unless, you know, that's the the person that died is the one that taught him to cook and he's got, you know, emotional baggage around going back into a kitchen. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right, right, right. So that to me was a little bit like, hmm, wait, what's going on here? Also, it seems strange that you didn't realize he didn't finish his degree. It seems like maybe, and I could be wrong here, but this is a, this is something you have to think about pretty hard. Did he let you maybe think that he finished his degree and just didn't correct your misperception? Because that's sort of a lie by omission. But if that didn't happen, then fine. I'm not trying to plan ideas in your head. But it just seems kind of weird that you just found out randomly that he didn't finish his degree. Uh, That just, I don't know. I feel like that's uh, strange. Then again, I don't talk about my schooling much with my wife. So Yeah, it just seems to me that she's she's got this hang up that she has to be with somebody who needs a degree. That's what I kind of got from the, the gist of the email, that she's concerned that he's not going to amount to anything if he doesn't have a degree. Right. Going forward in his life. But I also think probably her parents are worried more about that. And she's worried uh, about what yes. her parents think. I think she's probably OK with it. Not not stoked, but <laughs> co- at peace with it, probably. But I think she's yeah. more worried, like, oh, my God, what am I going to tell my parents when he they find out he does not have a degree? Like, what the what the hell? That's good. Because yeah. that for Tiger parents. For an Asian yeah. family with tiger parents, that is that is a nuclear holocaust of an announcement. Mm-hmm. That is so bad. Hi, we're getting married. Oh, what's his education? Oh, none. What? Because, it, look, it would be different if they were all immigrants and she was a nail tech somewhere and the guy didn't have a degree. It was like, oh, okay, whatever. First generation, this is how it goes. Working your way up, at least he got to the country. No, she's got like, what is it? She's got like 18 degrees. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. she's got all kinds of stuff in here that's just bananas. We edited out a lot of what she had because how many people could even have that combination of degrees, for God's sake? At 26, yeah. I mean, it was just unbelievable. This is a person who, if you listed all these degrees, there's probably one person at that institution that has that combination. So she didn't want us to throw these in there. And I think that that could be a big deal for her family to her but especially to the family and it would never go away it would never go away kind of a lifelong shame on the family oh man in a way that's just bananas it's just i cannot overstate this degrees don't matter as much i agree with that but the way that someone looks at education is important so this would be different if you were not that into academics. He had your degree, but he didn't have one and he had a trade. Like I mentioned, if you were a nail tech and he was a mechanic or something like that, and I'm not putting those at the same level by any stretch. I think trades are more valuable than degrees 99% of the time. Like I wish I had a trade. Uh, I guess law is a trade, but kind of wasn't the way I did it. But here it seems like you're into school. I mean, school is life. You said that earlier. You've turned academics up to 11 and it sounds like maybe he's kind of just not sure what he wants to do. Culinary school, then I drop out of this, do a little football, then not go back. This happens, but bear in mind that he might never care about school and he might never get a degree. That doesn't make him a bad person, but that may make him a values mismatch for you 
unless you guys come to terms with this. It's certainly going to be a values mismatch for your family, and you got to figure out what to do there. And look, that's also okay. As long as he finds something productive to do and contribute to the household in some way, if you're comfortable with him being a stay-at-home dad and think he'd be good at that, that's great. Actually, that would be amazing. My buddy's a stay-at-home dad. I think it's one of the best things that could possibly happen to a family, having a parent stay home. I know people disagree there sometimes. It could be mom or dad. Just make sure that he's okay with that and isn't just going to bumble around or feel insecure about it or worse, resent you for the fact that you're so ambitious and perhaps he doesn't have that same level of ambition. You've really got to straighten that out sooner rather than later and before your relationship gets more serious because your parents are going to blow a gasket for sure. You need to be on the same page with him before you present this to your family if that's what you decide to do. You can't bumble back and forth. You can't give him support about this and then introduce him to your family and your family goes nuclear and then you take their side over him because that's going to nuke your relationship. So you guys need to figure this ish out yesterday. But well, you you don't have to figure it out immediately. You got to figure it out before you tell the family what's up and before you get married and stuff like that. Or it's going to be a big problem, much bigger than it is now. Hey, if this is your first time listening to the show, welcome. Fan Mail Friday is a great sample of how we operate here, but by no means a full helping of all the show has to offer. Listener interactions, one of our favorite parts of the show, love looking in the Fan Mail Friday inbox for different reasons, as I explained earlier on the show. Our typical content, though, is much more in-depth. We take well-known top performers in their field, and we work to unpack their methods, their theories, their hard-earned insights. And these are people you either know already or you should know. And we use a longer format to help you understand what processes or steps or mindsets they used, which helped them become successful. And then we distill those concepts to help you apply them to your life. For a great place to start, check out some of our most popular episodes at theartofcharm.com. That's where you can find the best of, as well as our fundamentals toolbox, which includes what we like to call the basics of mixed mental arts, including topics such as reading body language and nonverbal communication, the science of attraction, negotiation techniques, networking and influence strategies, persuasion tactics, and everything else that we teach here on the show and at the live residential boot camps down in L.A., We'll send all of this to your inbox. Just go to theartofcharm.com slash challenge. And to learn more about their in-person training, go to theartofcharm.com slash bootcamp. Now, back to Fan Mail Friday. All right, next up. Hi, Jordan. I've always been a very quiet kid. Since childhood, I feared talking to strangers and spoke minimally even to my family. Growing up, I didn't have a lot of friends and was never the popular one. Now that I've graduated college and I'm working full-time, I can say that I've made great progress in coming out of my shell and have enough confidence to be effective at my job. I'm comfortable having conversations about work, but my low self-confidence creeps in during social events. I often expect to be ignored during group events and get excited when someone actually acknowledges my existence, even though there's no reason for a group of adults to go out of their way to ignore me. This only happens when I'm hanging out with people who've already met me and have gotten the impression that I'm not quote-unquote cool. I'm more comfortable introducing myself to strangers at networking events because then I can create a confident persona in front of somebody who doesn't know the old me. Do you have any advice on how not to slip back into low self-esteem mode when I'm hanging out with a group of people that have already labeled me as the shy, uncool one? Also, is there judgment of me all in my head? Is there a way to continue showing confidence even when feedback from others isn't the most encouraging. Thanks again for all that you do. Sincerely, confidently, underconfident. Huh. Okay. Well, this one's interesting in a way because I I can identify with this one way too strongly. <laughs> Their judgment of you might not all be in your head, but it is in part in your head. The good news is it's totally irrelevant whether it's in your head or it's real. So you can ignore feedback like this, real or imagined for that matter, when it doesn't help you. In this case, there's pretty much no benefit to feedback that tells you that someone perceives you in a way that you're actively working to change. You already have that information. You'll know when they're not doing it, but you're not going to have a degree of, oh, well, I think I'm getting slightly cooler because I got a little bit more eye contact from Angela this evening. I mean, it's just totally irrelevant. You're going to be in your head all the time about this. It's going to make it worse. You're going to analyze your behavior, which is going to make you unnatural and inauthentic. You're going to be less present. I mean, none of those things, none of those things is going to help you be more quote unquote cool or engaging or anything. Put yourself in environments 
where people don't have context for you. What I mean about that is go somewhere where people don't think, oh, there's Joshua, the confidently underconfident guy who's quiet and not cool. When I moved around a lot when I was younger, in college especially and beyond, I remember going to Ukraine and Mexico and Panama and Germany and Serbia and all these different countries, and I got to reinvent myself every time. And some of it was like try-hard douchebaggery, as reinventing yourself in your 20s tends to do. (laughs) But other stuff, I just realized, wow, I don't have, these people have no context for me. And when I would make close friends, if I was in Panama, say for several months working at the embassy and hanging out with these really smart guys, I remember telling my new friends, my colleagues, you know, I'm really shy at home. I'm not this like cool ladies man guy, as you guys can tell, because I'd be at clubs like going after chicks left and right. And they'd go, what are you talking about? You know, you, you're you not shy. You just walked up to the girl who won the Miss Panama runner up at beauty pageant who came here at a paid appearance and then the next the weekend before that the girl won some sexy dancing contest and you walked up to her and started talking to her and dating her like what are you talking about you're shy you're just bsing you're being fake modest and i was thinking no you don't understand i would have run in the other direction doing this thing at home and they just wouldn't believe me that their experience of me was the opposite of that and so they didn't treat me that way as a shy uncool guy they treated me the way that I, they were perceiving me with no context, which was, this guy just will go after whatever he wants. And that helped me grow, because I realized, well, wait a minute. If I can do that to the point where they're not seeing a fake Jordan, they're seeing what I'm doing here, then that means I can actually change who I am in a way that, that makes sense, in a positive way. So the best way to do this isn't to move to Ukraine or Mexico or Panama or anything like that. The best way to do this is to make a list of skills that you want to learn, And then find classes and groups and clubs that teach those skills. Join those clubs that deal with that. And it's a really easy way to find new environments quickly in your own hometown and practice being the new you that you want to be one degree at a time. You don't have to show up with, uh, you know, fake tattoos and jewelry and dressed all weird because you want to reinvent yourself. You can just shed the baggage of being underconfident or quiet. And you can just take a little bit more social risk because... If if you really embarrass yourself to the point where everyone says, oh, my God, get out of here, you can just not go anymore. By the way, that'll never happen. <laughs> you can, you have to do so <laughs> many things wrong in order to get banned from something like a club for role-playing games or movies or board games. I mean, come on. Finding those new environments, practice being the new you that you want to be, and not the one that you've been stuck with your whole life that you're no longer satisfied with. This is an exciting time. I think it's very exciting to reinvent yourself. It's much easier than you would expect. It doesn't happen as fast as you want, but it doesn't take as long as you think it will either. Speaking of imposter syndrome, let's go to the next one. Hey, Jordan, what are your thoughts on the benefits of limited imposter syndrome? You mentioned briefly at the end of the podcast that the presence of imposter syndrome suggests you are challenging yourself, which is a good thing. I would really like to hear you flesh this out a little bit more. I am currently a 2L at Columbia Law School. Uh, Damn. So you went to law school. What's a 2L? Uh, second year law student, Columbia Law School. This is a smart person. Or at least, All right. but I mean, he, he wouldn't say that he's smart. He would say, <laughs> well, you know, I slipped through the cracks. So yep. good, good crack to slip through. Wow. It's also a top five law school. And as far as I know, also the most expensive law school in the whole country. So. Not only did he slip through the crack, uh, one of the best cracks that you can slip through in terms of law schools, but the most expensive crack as well. So congratulations on that one. I would say the main reason I'm now at CLS is because of a healthy dose of imposter syndrome. I started law school at George Washington University and transferred to Columbia this year. A large part of my success in law school is my extra drive and hard work to prove to everyone that I'm not an imposter. I remember looking around my first day and hearing about what everyone else had done before school and their various accomplishments and being very intimidated. That gave me the drive to prove that I deserved to be there. Certainly, there's a point of diminishing returns, but if I had started law school thinking I belonged, I definitely think I would have had a false sense of confidence and not worked as hard. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Thanks, Ivan the Imposter. So, Ivan, definitely, this is a so classic textbook imposter syndrome. I love this, though. He writes, I remember hearing what everyone else had done before school, their various accomplishments and being very intimidated. This is literally how imposter syndrome kicks off at institutions of higher learning like Columbia, like Michigan, like Harvard. Yeah, I mean, this is the definition 
of how imposter syndrome happens. This is the birth thereof. What's really cool is Ivan's reaction here. He Instead of saying, oh my God, I'm going to get fired or they're going to figure me out and I'm going to get screwed and blah, 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 I don't belong here. He said, okay, I got to prove that I belong here. So he started busting his ass. That's how you kick ass in a situation like this. You use it to light a fire under your ass. You don't give up thinking that the battle cannot be won. So I agree. There is a point of diminishing returns of doing this. You can drive yourself insane. But if you'd started law school thinking you belonged, here's what would happen to those people. So when I started law school, and I've told this story before, but I'll, I'll, so I'll keep it short here. When I started law school, I had this exact same experience. And I thought, oh, my God, I could easily fail here if I'm not careful. So I didn't screw around. I didn't go out drinking every night in the beginning. Anyway, uh, I worked hard. I outstudied everyone. I made friends with all the smart kids. I formed a study group the first two days of school with all the other gunners was what we call them. And I'm sure they still call them that the, the overachievers. And I asked tons of questions and I did all the review stuff and I found reviews online and I borrowed people's case notes from the year before, before they got in demand. And I had older people tell me what I was doing right and wrong and give me class strategies. I needed that because I realized that if I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm just as good as any of these people or I'm great. I coasted through all my other classes, blah, 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 blah. That's what happened to a lot of these other really smart people at Michigan Law as well, also a, a top 10 law school. So I understand the mindset here. These people said, yeah, 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 but I got straight A's and I went to NYU or whatever, Harvard. And so they thought they were really good. So what they did is they coasted. They didn't do as well among other people. They started to realize, oh, crap, I'm not the only smart person in the room. I'm, I'm going to be in trouble. And a lot of them decided to, instead of work extra hard to outwork everybody and regain a competitive advantage, what they did was they said, screw it, bro. It doesn't matter. C's get degrees. Because then if they did mediocre or failed, they'd go, well, it's not like I really applied myself. You know, I went drinking every day and you studied. And I heard that. When I would get good grades, people would say, yeah, I guess I shouldn't drink every day and party. It's, I always see you studying. And I was just thinking... Yeah, I know you're trying to take a pot shot at me, but we're not going to care in 10 years or even one year that you went drinking every day. We're not going to care about that. I'm going to get a better job than you. I didn't say anything like that. In fact, I scarcely thought it because I thought my world could come crumbling down at any moment. But the fact that you're using this to light a fire under your ass is exactly what you're supposed to do with imposter syndrome. You're supposed to say, okay, my competitive advantage of being an amazing, unique snowflake is gone. What can I do? Working harder than everyone else is usually what you can do. And then when you get a job out of this, Ivan, you're going to end up in an environment where everybody works hard and everybody's smart, and you're going to have to find another competitive advantage. And let me tell you what that is right now. It's soft skills, relationships, persuasion, and networking. If you can get those, most of your comrades, and I shouldn't say that, but you did name yourself Ivan, most of your colleagues and comrades in whatever Wall Street or investment bank firm you end up in, they are going to sleep on that too. So start learning these networking skills now. It sounds like you are. I mean, you're listening to AOC. This is what we do. Once you start applying these things we're teaching here and uh, you get your butt into our social capital networking class, which I know it sounds salesy when I say stuff like that, but I mean it. That That is designed. That is the class I wish I had when I started working on Wall Street, because it's all about those soft skills. So in closing here, uh, Your Honor, imposter syndrome is good for high performers <laughs> because it lights a fire under our butts and challenges us. And a lot of people give up in the face of imposter syndrome because they need that excuse that they didn't try in case they fail. And since that's not you, you've got a huge advantage here. So as long as imposter syndrome motivates you instead of discouraging you, you're doing it right. And I'm glad to see that. I'm really, ex this is a great letter. Thank you for writing in. All right, last but not least. Hey, Art of Charmers. Banter, rapport, adding value to others, and building meaningful relationships has never been a problem for me. These are my strengths, part of my job, and I gain fulfillment from these interactions. People tend to gravitate toward the authentic, trustworthy vibe I present. However, because I'm an introvert, I have a finite amount of extroverted energy that I'm able to exude. Then I must retreat and recharge, and I find myself struggling with maintaining these accumulating potential relationships. I've learned through experience that not giving myself enough solo recharging time can lead to regretfully rude and snarky interactions that burn bridges. 
in that it's hard for me to juggle multiple social engagements within a given week. In my late 20s, I devolved into a more reserved, cautious version of my effusive self in a majority of social situations in order to observe and screen for valuable individuals and intentionally keep my circle small and therefore manageable and meaningful. It wasn't until years and a lot of maturity later, and through listening to your podcasts regarding social capital, that I'm thinking I need to reframe my approach to social interactions. Maybe I'm keeping my circle too small because I believe I have limited social energy to give. But am I missing out on loads of personal and career growth opportunities since I already have the innate social competency to accelerate and gain from? I'd love to use my emotional intelligence strengths to increase social capital, but knowing myself, I need to continue to maintain adequate amounts of alone time for fulfilling and deep work and sustaining social tolerance. Do you have any advice for an introvert who's interested in cultivating a balance between gaining and maintaining meaningful social capital, yet nurturing an adequate allotment of needed alone time? Thank you. Introvert interested in expansion. So this is an interesting one because it sounds like she's saying hey, I'm really into all of this stuff that you teach in social capital and I'm really good at it. And then kind of goes on to saying, except I need like a week to recharge from everything, which to me seems like an unusually long period of time. So I'm going to read into this and say that she did a really good job of learning how to be social despite a strong aversion to it. She's probably very much not it's sort of not the natural extrovert in any way at all. She says introvert, but man, if you need a week to recover from a social event and yet you actively have found ways to enjoy these, I give you major props. I think that's very amazing. Frankly, there's that that must have taken a lot of work in your case. I would say that you should focus on depth over breadth of relationships. Of course, a few close friends, a few really great people in your life that aren't as exhausting to hang out with is going to be better than going to some mixer or some big party that's going to really take things out of you. Also, find people who are connectors who can help you expand your circle because they enjoy doing it and they have lots of connections. And you can deliver value to these people in other ways. You can be a really good friend to them. You can provide personal and emotional support. You can connect them to other people that you have great relationships with. You don't have to all be super connectors to benefit from having a super connector in your circle. I'm known among my circle, both super connectors and otherwise, as somebody who knows everybody. That's great. But my friends who don't know that many people, I don't care. If they come over and they bake a pie, that's fine. If they invite me over for a drink or they have me at their birthday party, that's fine. If they pick me up from the airport, that's fine. You know, I don't care what value they offer. If they're just fun to hang out with, I don't care. I'm not going to say, well, you've never made introductions for me. No, we're friends. It doesn't matter what my strengths are compared to theirs. It really doesn't. So create those relationships with a couple super connectors, and then you don't have to worry about networking everywhere all the time for yourself. It's better to do it yourself, certainly, but you have a limited capacity to do this. So Create a relationship or a set of relationships that you can maintain. Don't worry about scaling it so much. I'm not letting you off the hook here. I think you need to practice these skills in a way that matters and makes sense. I think that you should also, and you have done well, realizing that you have a limited capacity for certain things and you're working on that capacity actively from the sound of it, but you're not pushing yourself to the point where you're just a pain to hang around because you're exhausted, but you feel like you have to do it. It's a social muscle. It builds up over time. Don't let yourself off the hook either uh, because of this answer. I think it's great that you're working on this. I think you should keep doing it, but I don't think you should beat yourself up that you need time to recharge. That's just the way that this works for you for now. And you might see that that flips or changes later. And this is what the social capital product and course are all about as well. The art of charm.com slash social. It's about creating scalable networks, doing this in a way that's systemized in a way that doesn't burn you out in a way that doesn't seem inauthentic. It's really built for you. So I'm glad that you are using this product and other people who are interested in that uh, find it at the slash social. But I'm proud of you for this. I think this is you're showcasing a lot of work here that you haven't mentioned, but I can read it between the lines. So props. All right. Documentary of the week. I have been playing freaking Oculus Rift at my brother-in-law's house and tearing <laughs> robots apart and doing VR and being a fatty. So I haven't a watched a damn You've been thing. a fat nerd fat all Fat nerd. Week. Just That's a, it. a furred. Yeah. Have you, pl- have you messed with <laughs> Oculus at all, by the way? No, I have not. So 
for those of you who may not know, Oculus Rift is virtual reality. I mean, it's it's this stuff is basically in its infancy. However, you're wearing a big screen on your face and it's very light and it's very 3D and you can see these avatars of your hands that you're using in these controllers that you kind of wear slash hold and it is really cool. I mean, you can be in a small room (laughs) and you're walking around New York shooting robots or blowing stuff up or killing zombies and your brain just totally suspends disbelief in terms of the graphics and motion stuff not being totally on point yet. And you just get used to it. And you really, you know, you're playing a video game or, but your brain is legit tricked. You know, your brain acts as if you're in this world, except you still sort of at some point know that you can't just walk around your whole house because you got wires, but it's incredible. It really is a very cool look at what's going to be in the future and playing with something like Oculus, just even watching videos on it is just so interesting. And I just think, wow, my kids are never going to have to look at a 2D screen and experience things that way for long periods of time. They're going to have such more, so much more immersive interactive experiences. And I think it might actually be good for our mental health long term, although there's going to be all kinds of weird problems, of course. But I think it might actually be good for us if we can figure out how to do it in the right way, which, of course, humanity never does. So we're all screwed. But, man, I'll tell you, if you find yourself interested in this kind of thing, Oculus always goes on sale for like 350 The problem is you need a nice computer to hook it up to, so it's not a cheap toy. But if you're a type of person who likes gadgets, I would say this is a cool thing to have around. Even if you just wear it, lay down, and watch movies, it's pretty damn cool. It's very unique. It's unbelievable, really. You can sit in a virtual movie theater, Jason. This is one of the most basic uses of it. You can sit in a virtual movie theater in the middle seats. There'll be people from all over the world with their avatars sitting in these seats. You can chat. You can talk about the movie. So if you're watching a terrible movie, like if you and I are sitting here with Oculus on and we decide to watch Rambo 3, we can just crack jokes with all these other geeks watching this movie at the same time. And it's fun as hell. You're staying in your house to go out and be with people. And, you know, the reason I have a home theater is so people will not talk during a movie. And now it's like we have more technology so people can talk during the movie. But think about this. Your home theater was expensive. Oculus is like 350 The movies, you can play them off YouTube. You could route your freaking computer video out into this thing through the input in this movie theater room. So you can sit in the movie theater. You can kit it out to make it look like your house. But you could be in a stanky, wet basement. It doesn't matter. You can just experience stereo, amazing sound and video, and you could just be watching dumb music videos. It, it's just it changes everything because you don't need any of the infrastructure that you need normally to create this kind of experience for yourself. I totally understand it. I mean, in the 90s, we used to go to actual video arcades that had VR rigs in them. And, you know, it, since I was watching Battlestar Galactica last week, speaking of nerds, I have it stuck in my head. This has all happened before. This is all this will all happen again. VR comes and goes in waves, so we'll see how it how it lasts this time. This is different because I remember old VR, and it sucked, and it was super expensive. This is more fun, and it's not just like, whoa, I can turn around and shoot. It's like, oh, I can watch a kid's movie where I can sort of interact with crap on the table and throw th- pies at the little hamsters, and they throw them back, and I can play tennis with a friend. You know, it's it's really, I'm telling you, this is here to stay This is not Google Glass. It's not the VR of the 90s. This is a different way of experiencing everything from movies to chat rooms to video games. I'm telling you, I could be wrong. Yeah. But I think it's I think this is for real this time. Okay. You know, I'm looking forward to augmented reality instead of virtual reality. But uh, since you've got to try it, I'm going to go with your opinion on it. That's cool. I just sat around and watched Netflix all week. (laughs) AR is cool. Augmented reality where and for those of you who don't know what that is. Augmented reality, where essentially you look through a screen, like even your phone, and you can see things that, quote unquote, are not there. Like if you're watching a basketball game, you would look on your phone and it would show the stats of each player and you could touch the stats bar and it would show you how they're doing this game. Things like that. I mean, augmented reality really has, it's like a heads up display for real life. That's what Pokemon Go was, which is the dumbest use of it, in my opinion, but also a very good demonstration yeah. of how wildly this can catch on. And I think that's going to be very cool. But sometimes I just want to watch a stinking movie, but I don't want a 200-inch projection screen 
television rig in my living room. I just want to lay in the truck bed or whatever I have, you know, and, or With lay down. With your $2,000 PC wired up. Yeah. You could do it on your laptop with Oculus. You know, you probably couldn't run the games, but you can certainly route video through it. You know, it's no big deal. Good point. And and eventually, th- all the processing is going to be done inside Oculus or inside the goggles. In fact, a lot of it already is. So you'll be able to take these things portable and you'll be able to just interact with even your... F- I, I guarantee you that it's only a matter of time till iPhone 15 via Bluetooth or whatever they're using at that time has the Apple headset that you just wear and you can interact with everything on your phone in, by just being in it. Why type on a little screen? You'll see that in a couple of years because Apple actually introduced AR kit with iOS 11. This is stuff we cover on Grumpy Old Geeks every week, so kind of up to speed on it. But yeah, this stuff is coming faster than you think, but it's mainly everybody's moving towards AR instead of VR because everybody puts so much money into VR and the Oculus, and there's a reason it's on sale every week is because nobody's buying them, and that's a problem. Yeah. Especially when you're trying to get those, you know, those group experiences where you can all be in the same room, but not in the same room. Yeah, I bought my brother-in-law a second one, in part because there's a zombie game that looked amazing, and you can do two players, and I thought, (laughs) this is going to be so rad. And so I bought it, and then I thought, well, wait a minute. Coolest date ever. You could go to Paris. You know what I mean? You can, (laughs) Me and Jen can wear these things and walk around real places. Um, And we can do fun things, and we can throw snow, have snowball fights or whatever in the middle of summer in California. Those things are more fun than you think. Some of it's novelty, but some of it is really interesting. It, remember how cool the Wii was, where you could play Mario oh, yeah. Tennis and you're looking at a screen? Imagine that you actually think you're playing tennis, and you're hitting this ball around, and, and these things have great accelerometers and work really well. You can, you can do all kinds of really cool stuff with these things. It's really, really, really interesting. Um, it's only a matter of time till it gets so real that it's more fun than real life and then now we're in a sci-fi novel anyway so that serves as your documentary this week (laughs) and you know i hate recommending this kind of thing but if you have a nice computer and you've been thinking oh well i don't care about vr and i don't think you need that um, amazing of a pc if you want a game you need a crazy video card and stuff like that but i think a lot of it can be done on an imac or even a new or a newer desktop you don't have to i don't think laptops work so well go to best buy and grab an oculus on sale 350 if it's too expensive for you i understand um you can also i hate recommending stuff like this you can buy it you keep it for a while if you don't like it you can always return it right but check this stuff out i'm not saying you'll fall in love with it i am saying that the experience is interesting if you got a friend with one and he doesn't use it borrow it you got a friend with one and he does use it go over and play i think it's a worthwhile experience i really do oh by the way you can go to a microsoft store you know those stores that try to be apple stores and they're mm-hmm. conveniently located across slash next to the Directly Apple store. across from an Apple store. In every yeah. freaking mall. They have a Vive, which is, I think, even more high-end than Oculus. They have a Vive station, or at least they used to. So you can go and try it. And if you go a, during a quiet time at the mall, a.k.a. not post-Christmas bonanza, you can just play it as long as you want with no line. They don't care. There's a guy just sitting there texting his friends because there's nobody using it. So if you go when there's not a bunch of kids trying to play Mario Kart or whatever it is on Vive, you can go there and try it. And some of these games are just, they'll blow your mind. And you can tell them, hey, I want to use Google Earth. And that alone is worth the the trip. So anyway, I'm done raving about this. I know it's nerdy, (laughs) but I think it's an interesting way to look at things that are going to be bigger in the future. Um, Even for industry, this will be important. And you'll see why as soon as you use it, because your brain's going to start going, oh my God, we could do this. Oh my gosh, we could do that. Oh my God, we could do this with that. Imagine, Jason, just for our own purposes, if you had Oculus, I had Oculus, and we got an Oculus to the guest, and it required very, just a USB plug-in and no other specialized tech, we could all be sitting in a room, and it would feel as real as if we were in that room. And in a way, I mean, you have to suspend disbelief. Your brain does that quite well automatically. And we could just sit there and have a conversation, and I could look at my notes on a virtual iPad or even have them on a heads up display so nobody else can see it, it'd be really cool. And I find that I think that would be easier to engage with a lot of these guests. Cause you've seen, and you know, sometimes we do interviews and we're like, uh, you want to just finish your thing that you're doing? And they're like, Oh, sorry, you can hear that. We're like, yeah, I can tell you're <laughs> playing with your dog or texting your kids or checking an urgent email. Like, welcome to the show. 
for Frick's sake. Right? It's rare, but <laughs> they would not do that if their head was wrapped in us and vice versa. You know, it would yeah. be impossible. So anyway, check that stuff out. If you don't, fine, but I'm recommending it. Hope you all enjoyed the show today. I want to thank everyone that wrote in this week. And don't forget, you can email us, friday at jordanharbinger.com, to get your questions answered on the air. I keep everyone anonymous. You can either make up your own funny name. We can do it. Or if you got feedback for the show, we're fans of strong opinions loosely held. We love to argue like we're right and listen like we're wrong. So don't be shy to hit us up over here. A link to the show notes for this episode can be found at theartofcharm.com slash FMF147. Quick shout outs to everyone who's been hitting me up about cryptocurrency and blockchain stuff. Speaking of nerdy tech, this is one of those cool underground revolutions that is boiling up and really exciting. And I'm happy that I can share that passion with fans of this show. I don't want to say more about it because we'll go on another VR type tangent here. Yeah, That's all I'm going to say about that. Are you in a strange land listening to our familiar voices? Fine. Great. Are you in virtual reality? If so, hit me up. We'll shout you out on the show. Love to hear from you either way. I'm on Twitter at theartofcharm.com, which is a great way to engage with the show. And I'm also on Instagram at Jordan Harbinger. Jason, tell them where they can find you. I'm on Twitter at JPDef and Instagram at JPD. And you can always check out my tech news podcast, Grumpy Old Geeks. You can find out more about that at GOG.show, where I'm sure we will have Jordan Harbinger on soon to talk about cryptocurrency and VR. Perfect. Also, don't forget about the Art of Charm Challenge. Go to theartofcharm.com slash challenge. We'll take you step by step at becoming better at making personal and professional connections for that matter, becoming a better networker. We talked about that today and increasing your personal social capital and your charisma. It's for both guys and gals. It's a little baby toe in the water there on getting this stuff and applying the stuff that you learn on the show every week. So check that out at theartofcharm.com slash challenge. More from AOC at theartofcharm.com, including info on their live residential boot camps that those guys run every single week in L.A. with AJ and Johnny. So if you want to dig into this stuff and work on your AOC skills with AJ and Johnny as your coaches, that's all at theartofcharm.com slash boot camp. Now stay charming, get out there and connect and leave everything and everyone better than you found them. Can't get enough golf? Podcast One is the new home of Golflandia with Matthew Wiley. Every Monday, all season long, tune in to hear Matt talk predictions, tournament recaps, and interview guests from in and around the world of PGA and Euro Golf. He'll even talk business, branding, and family life. Because it all relates to golf. Download episodes of Golflandia every Monday exclusively on PodcastOne.com, the new Podcast One app, and Apple Podcasts.